John, glad to be with you again this morning. And uh, while John said I have two hours of material to present, I could I could talk for two hours and more on this subject. But we're going to get it all into one hour if we can, and uh, hope that uh, that you'll enjoy what we have for you. I believe that we're living in a remarkable time in Earth's history. Uh, I guess you also think the same. And the second coming of Jesus Christ is very, very near. Now that's a conviction of mine. It's a conviction that uh, is based upon my study of the Word of God and my observation of, of events that are taking place in the world all around us. And, uh, and I want to share with you some things this morning that I think will help us to appreciate this truth and maybe to uh, be more diligent in our preparation for the second coming of Jesus. Um, I'm excited about the nearness of Christ's return. Are you? You know, we're tired of this old world of sin, aren't we? It's time to go home and, and to be with our Lord, and that will be a wonderful time, of course. Um, you know, Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 37071, Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near, she says. And then she says, we are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. That's interesting, isn't it? If we neglect to, to know, if we neglect to discover and to know the nearness of the coming of Christ, or that it is near, then that's going to be fatal for us. Um, here's another statement from Mrs. White. She says, We're standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. If our people were half awake and if they realized the nearness of the events portrayed in the Revelation, a reformation would be wrought in our churches and many more would believe the message. Now the prophecies of Revelation chapter 13 are specifically or specially significant for the Adventist church in these last days, in fact for the whole world for that matter, but, but for you and me as members of God's church. And I want to tell you that when you take these Bible prophecies from the book of Revelation and other places uh, as expanded by certain chapters in the book Great, Great Controversy by Ellen White and you superimpose those over unfolding events in the religio-political uh, arena of this world, we have what I see as a perfect match. I see events beginning to take place in the political and religious world that uh, are particularly significant in terms of the prophecies of Revelation and uh, specifically chapter 13. I, uh, I want to read to you from a statement from uh, Ellen White, a great controversy again, which says this, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power and under the influence of this threefold union, this country, that is the United States, will follow in the steps of Rome in tramping on the rights of conscience. Now that's a very significant statement and it's one of those things that we need to take notice of. Let me read further. When the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state or government to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy. And this is what I want to show you uh, as we go through how there are concerted efforts in the United States to bring these things to pass, to bring unity together between the various branches of the Christian church and then to use their united strength and numbers to influence government, to enact laws that will favor the chosen position of those uh, religious organizations. If you put that alongside those inspired statements, uh, alongside uh, 
uh, other statements that are coming out of, uh, of the Christian world, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Here is a statement from the Christian American, a, a magazine that uh, is published in the United States, and it says, After nearly four centuries of division and hostility, Protestants and Catholics have taken an important step toward unity. Forty key evangelistic, uh, evangelical and Catholic leaders signed a statement at the Institute on Religion and Public Life in New York City on March 29, 1994, urging their followers to accept each other as Christians, to put aside differences, and to contend for common civil causes. And that was in a, a document entitled, the declaration, the, uh, the declaration was entitled, in Evangelicals and Catholics Together, dash, the Christian mission in the third millennium. And this was then followed on May 25 of the next year by uh, an encyclical from Pope John Paul II in which the Pope praises the initiatives of the churches in the United States in their attempt for unity, and he calls for closer bonds. Now, at this point, uh, I want to introduce an organization, uh, that um, a conservative organization known as the Christian Coalition. Uh, it was started by a man called Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson is a tele-evangelist in the United States, one of the most prominent, one of the, the better known uh, in America. He was a one-time hopeful for the U.S. presidency. In fact, he ran against Ronald Reagan in an attempt to be chosen as the, uh, as the uh, Republican candidate for the presidency, and he failed in that. But this man has a, a long list of, of uh, qualifications from universities, doctoral degrees and other things, he is the host of the 700 Club. Uh, he owns the Christian Broadcasting Network and Regent University. Uh, this is a very large university. It has 3,000 students studying law alone in that university, south of Washington. And I've been down there and, and visited that place. Now, the Christian Coalition is, is a word. The word coalition means, of course, coming together to achieve common goals. Does it not? You have the coalition in Iraq, the United States and the British and some others trying to do what they want to do there. It's called a coalition. So when you have the Christian coalition, then it's a gathering together of, of people, Christian people, who, who, want to, uh, who have common goals and would like to achieve something that is common between all of them. Except that the Christian coalition is not only made up of Christians. The Christian coalition involves organizations such as, as uh, evangelical Protestants, now, the term evangelical Protestants is a term that, that in, involves or incorporates uh, Protestant churches that are more, uh, more faithful to the Bible than some of the more liberal denominations. Uh, they take the Bible much more literally than some of the, the other denominations. So you have the, the evangelical Christians, you have the Roman Catholics, you have Jews, they're not Christians, but they're Jews. They're, you see, they have common interests with these religious organizations. And you have some Muslims that have joined in with them. Uh, and there are others who, who uh, we won't take time to mention. And this coalition, which has the name Christian Coalition, is, um, is determined to, to bring into American society uh, moral values as they see them moral values to replace the decadence of our modern age. Now, that sounds very good, sounds Im impressive. I attended uh, a number of the Path to Victory conferences, all that were held in Washington, D.C., when I was in the United States. Now, the first one I attended was in 1994. There were 4,000 people present, and it was just like a political rally. There was an awful lot of hoopla and balloons and all kinds of carry-on, you know, when the balloons were let down out of the ceiling and people leapt to their feet and they were punching the balloons and bursting them and shouting and, and praising God, you know, it, um, it reminded me of a political um, meeting, a political rally. It was also a parade of prominent politicians. Um, the, the people that were present at that Christian coalition, it, it's a very impressive list of people, and uh, maybe I'll mention some of those a little later if I can find the piece of paper with all the names on it. But um, uh, it included uh, governors of states. It included members of parliament, uh, of the Senate. It included 
hopefuls in the presidential race, people who wanted to become president of the United States. There were four of them at one of these Christian, uh, these uh, Path to Victory conferences. Four men who were jockeying with each other to be chosen as the president of the United States. These are the kinds of people. There were lawyers there. Uh, the the um, uh, James Dobson's uh, uh, organization, you know James Dobson, don't you? The, the home family man. Uh, his organization was represented quite extensively by people from that organization there. Um, uh, Dan Quayle was there, vice president at the time, Phil Graham, Lamar Alexander, Robert Dole, and his wife, Elizabeth Dole. Uh, the, the list is a, a who's who of significant people in the United States. Um, people who, who are, are uh, uh, compares on television programs, radio programs as well, some of the best known names in the United States. And they were there. And they worked together. A lot of the time was spent in, uh, in putting together strategy to win either the midterm elections or at later conferences the, the election for the, the President of the United States. Um, you see, this man, Pat Robertson, had wanted to be President of the United States himself, and when he failed to achieve that, he decided that he would, he would uh, take control of, uh, of government anyhow, by other means, see, and through the efforts of the organization known as the Christian Coalition. Uh, they sent out 100, 000, uh, 100 million voter guides. Now, I've got one here. It's the Congressional Scorecard, and... Um, when you open this up, this congressional scorecard lists all the people in every state of the United States who are seeking to be, to, uh, to, to be voted into the uh, United States House of Representatives and uh, into the United States Senate. Every name that's on the ballot that people would vote for in their states are all here. And on this, uh, this document also, you have listed the... Uh, uh, the areas in which the Christian coalition had uh, moral convictions. For example, there's a section here that, that talks about uh, abortion clinics and points out that uh, the Christian coalition has no time for abortion clinics, you see. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a section that deals with uh, gays, lifting ban, the ban on gays in the military. And they felt that uh, the bans on gays in the military should not be lifted. There's a section about uh, uh, gays being uh, allowed to, uh, to work in the Boy Scouts organization, and they were against that, you see. Uh, there's, there's also reference here to uh, some um, initiatives that would teach sex to kindergarten children. Uh, there's another section here on, uh, on pornography on the Internet, um, there's also a section here on condoms for children without parental consent in high schools. And, uh, and the Christian Coalition was against that, you see, against the provision of condoms to children in high schools without the parental consent. And so the, the purpose of this, of course, is to show where all of these candidates who are hoping to be elected to government, where these candidates stood on these vital issues that are so significant to the Christian Coalition and to the moral health of the United States. And so you, if you lived in a certain state, you'd simply look down here and you'd say, well, in Illinois, I see here that this man, Rush, he, uh, he doesn't agree with the Christian coalition on number one, five, seven, and ten. And you would know, therefore, how to vote if you didn't want these people in Parliament. That's the idea of it. It's a, a voting scorecard, a, a directive to the people. And uh, I have a letter from, uh, from Pat Robertson in which he says that, that uh, this here, this material gives tremendous power, tremendous voting power to the people of the United States. And they were determined to keep out of Parliament the people who did not agree with, uh, with their, their concepts and their ideas. Um, I, I was interested in the way Ed Reed put it in one of his books, and you can buy his books at the ABC. Ed Reed said, it is going to take all the good guys working together to solve the problem. That's the attitude of the Christian coalition. They had to get together all the good guys, see, uh, into, into a, a coalition with common uh, concepts, common ideas, common views. And as Pat Robertson said, our ultimate goal is to restore America to greatness under God. Well, now, 
that's that's interesting. I I, I thought you'd be interested to uh, to know what some of the uh, the uh, the uh, convictions of these people are. Um, as I said before, they're against pornography. They're against violence and, and uh, uh, sexual explicit things on television and uh, radio. They're against abortion on demand. They're against the moral decadence of our age. Uh, you know, these are things you can buy into, aren't they? I mean, Seventh-day Adventists g could go along with this. And I have met quite a number of Seventh-day Adventists in the United States who have, uh, who have uh, regularly contributed money, large sums of money, to the Christian coalition because they feel that, that uh, we're on side with these people. We, we have common goals, com common interests. But I want to tell you, friends, that things are not always what they appear to be, and that's what uh, Dr. Pullian told us the other uh, on Sabbath, wasn't it? Things are not always what they appear to be because while these people have an interest in, in, uh, uh, in moral excellence, you need to also know that the Christian coalition and its membership is emphatically opposed to the separation of church and state. Now, what's the position of the Adventist church on this? We believe in the separation of church and state, don't we? We believe in it. These people are emphatically opposed to the separation of church and state. Let me read to you what Pat Robertson said. Our ultimate goal is to restore America to greatness under God and uh, through moral strength. Our further goal is to motivate Christian activists at the grassroots level, then to train them to first be effective participants in the American political process and ultimately to serve as godly leaders in the public arena. At Regent, meaning Regent University, which is his university, at Regent, leaders are being challenged and commissioned to claim and occupy our nation's courtrooms, classrooms, businesses, churches, the media, and other offices. So they're nowhere to, to strike, don't they? I mean, if you, had, if, if you had your people in the courtrooms and the classrooms, the businesses, the churches, and the media, you have control of the country, don't you? I mean, that's, that's where all the influences are. That's where the, the, the laws are, are enacted. That's where decisions are made. Uh, and that's where people are influenced, through all of those places. The classroom, the schools, see? The media, television, radio, newspapers. You've got it all. And that's the goal of this man, uh, Pat Robertson, to get his people into, into all these places so that uh, they might be able to influence the, uh, the government the way they want it to be influenced. Now, there's one uh, uh, actor, if we could call it that, one player in the, in the whole scheme by the name of Keith Fournier. Keith Fournier was a Roman Catholic. He used to work at, uh, at uh, a large, uh, the Franciscan University in Ohio. He used to teach there. He is now the... Uh, the director of the Center for Law and Justice at Regent University, Pat Robertson's place. And this man is, is a Roman Catholic and a, a very intelligent man. And he says this, people criticized us for being right-wing religious extremists. What we are promoting are not religious ideas, but just human rights. The wall of separation between church and state that was erected by secular humanists. Now notice that, see. And other enemies of religious freedom. So anybody who's against the, the, uh, the combination of church and state is, is called what? Called a secular humanist or an enemy of religious freedom here. That's what Keith Fournier says. Any of these people... Uh, he says the, the, the wall of separation between church and state that was erected by these people, these enemies of religious freedom, has to come down. And those opposing our views, which include Seventh-day Adventists, are the new fascists. Now, you know, we're familiar with the prophecy of Revelation 13. And the first part of that prophecy had been fulfilled. And then you come down to halfway through and, and you begin to read texts there about the, the beast that comes up 
you know, with, with two horns like a lamb. And we have recognized that this beast of Revelation 13 represents the rise of, of the United States, Protestantism, particularly in the United States, that it would speak as a lamb, you know. And at first, that's what they sounded like. They were against violence and, uh, and uh, sexual explicitness on television. They were against pornography, against abortion on demand against the moral decadence of our age. That sounds like the lamb speaking, doesn't it? Because they're in, in, in harmony, in, in support of good things. But then you, you read here, and they start calling people like us the new fascists. And the Bible says that this beast that comes up like a lamb would speak like what? Like a dragon. See, This sounds to me like the voice of the dragon. Listen to this. Right, Pat Robertson had the last word at, uh, word at uh, the banquet the evening one of these conferences closed, and he said 2,300 years ago in this world there was a situation like we're facing today when God's people were captive to heathen, non-Christian people. A person named Haman determined that he would get rid of all the Christians, so he erected some gallows to hang Mordecai on. You know the story now, don't you, he's referring to? Then he said, you remember the story of Mordecai and Esther? And sweeping his hand over the assembly, he said, Who knows, but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Talking to the people in the Christian Coalition Conference. Who knows, but you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. These gallows that have been erected by the secular humanists, the people who are against the union of church and state, these gallows that have been erected by the secular humanists, we will hang them all on their own gallows. God told me in December that he was going to bless the Christian coalition beyond our wildest imagination. Then he goes on to say here, a little further down, um, we have been growing, we're alive, growing and better organized than ever. We'll be back in 93, we'll be back in 94, we'll be back in 95, we'll be back in 96, we'll be back in 97, we'll be back until we take it all. And then he finished by saying this, the recent major natural disasters, the San Francisco earthquake, Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane Aniti, are evidence that God is displeased with our godless nation. We can expect these disasters to increase until we get our nation back to God. Now, you, you would have thought that man had been reading great controversy, wouldn't you? Because that's what Mrs. White has to say in great controversy about, uh, about some of these things. Now, I don't know where I am in my notes. I've no idea. But that's all right, isn't it? We're among friends here. Um, yeah. Oh, I want to read you what Ralph Reed had to say. That's what I've got written down here. You know, Ralph Reed, who uh, was the executive secretary of the Christian Coalition, is a young man, a very charismatic young man. There's a picture of him here if you want to see him later. Uh, a very fine-looking young man who has a very uh, long list of accomplishments in the political arena. And he was, uh, for some years, the executive secretary of the Christian Coalition. And uh, he addressed uh, uh, some of the delegates with these words at the Catholic Alliance. Now, the Catholic Alliance is, um, is a, a, an attempt on the part of the Catholics to catch up with the Protestants on this Christian coalition business because they were not the initiators of the Christian coalition and they got left behind a bit and then they came in as members and they decided that they should have within the Catholic Church uh, uh, an organization that was the Catholic uh, branch of the Christian coalition where they could come up with their ideas and then share them with the, with the main body. And so at the inaugural meeting of the Catholic Alliance that was held in Boston, they invited this Protestant, uh, Ralph Reed, the se Executive Secretary of Christian Coalition, to come and address them. He was their guest speaker. And during his, his speech, he said this, You and I are literally standing at an historic moment in evangelical and Catholic relationships. We had, just last year, the signing of the Evangelicals and Catholics Together Accord. We agreed as Catholics and Protestants to focus on what unites us rather than on what divides us. Ladies and gentlemen, there is far more 
that unites Catholics and Protestants in America then divides us. And we've got to transcend the centuries of distrust and suspicion that have divided us. And we've got to unite together to return America to moral greatness again. Why are we coming together in what I believe is the most significant flowering of ecumenical cooperation since the Reformation in the 16th century, he asks. Then he says, the reason is because the darkness has become so pervasive and the social pathologies have become so can, uh, cancerous and the arguments for common sense that we forward together are so morally compelling that we can no longer afford to be divided. It is a luxury we can no longer afford. And so he is telling the Catholics, we've got to get together on those things in which we agree and forget those things in which we no longer agree. Now these statements by Dr. Reed can be interpreted as nothing um, less than, as I see it, the fulfillment of Ellen White's predictions when you realize who this man is and what the organization is that he represents. Um, Ellen White's statement, which I think we had on one of these earlier pages, if I can find it, says, when the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as they are held by them in common. Isn't that what he was saying to the Catholics? You know, we, we agree. We have all these things in common. He says, there is far more that unites us rather than on what divides us. We must focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. And she was talking about when the churches come together, uniting on such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, then they will influence the state to enforce their decrees, to sustain their institutions, and then Protestant America will have formed an image to uh, the Roman hierarchy. Now, let me see. We've read that. In the movements, great controversy says, in the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the church the support of the state, Protestants are following in the steps of papists. Nay, more, they are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she lost in the old world. Let the principle once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws, in short, that the authority of the church and state is to dominate the conscience, and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. The Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are only when it is too late to escape the snare, Ellen White says. So she has a lot in the book Great Controversy on these issues. And uh, that's why I have found it very interesting to compare what's, what's happening in the United States to what uh, she has said. Now, you know, when, when one considers these things, you wonder how, um, how they can possibly um, bring about what they have in mind. Um, they have these, uh, these voter guides, which they're sending out, of course. And uh, if, the, if the, the candidates are not supportive of the Christian coalition's goals, they will be targeted for defeat at the next election. It's as simple as that. Pat Robertson said in a message to political leaders of the United States, if you advocate the agenda of the radical left, you will not be re-elected. Now, that's bold speech, isn't it? You'll not be re-elected. Um, well, Ellen White told us that the rulers and legislators will, quote, yield to the popular demand on religious matters in order to secure public favor. And I believe we need to watch these developments because uh, uh, that's what's happening in the United States right now. In fact, uh, Pat Robertson in a speech at one of these Christian coalition meetings said, that uh, the uh, Christian Coalition is such a powerful organization in the United States now that people will be calling from Washington. When he used the word Washington, he means, he means the, uh, the uh, 
Parliament House, you know, Government House. People will be calling from Washington to ask, what is the position of the Christian coalition so that we will know how to vote on issues that come before the, the government for consideration? They want to know what's the Christian coalition's position so that they can vote in harmony with it and thus secure their positions in, uh, in, in government. Though they, Protestants, blind their own eyes to the fact they are now adopting a course, Ellen White says, which will lead to the persecution of those who conscientiously refuse to do what the rest of the Christian world are doing. I, uh, I, I used to wonder how in the world they would ever be able to cope with knowing you know, who, who is with them and who is not with them. But you know, when we lived in the United States, we discovered that they have it all on record. Whenever I went into a shop and used my credit card to buy something, I would notice that up on the screen in front of the, the shop assistant who was serving me, there would come my name, my address, my detail, all the details about me. It's all up there on the screen. I'd never told these people these things, but they'd found them out and they have it there in their computer system. Um, I remember Dr. Reed, Dr. George Reed, who uh, until he retired recently was the head of the General Conference Biblical Research Institute, a wonderful theologian, a humble but great man. I remember him taking a worship in the General Conference one day and he held up a document which he had. It was a, a publication that had been sent to him in the post from these organizations that, that sell lists of people so that if you want to advertise your products, you can get the, the names and addresses of all these people that might be interested in your product and you can send out your advertising to them and you buy these lists. Well, he had one sent to him. And it's interesting because in that list, um, it, it had churches. And you could look down the, 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 uh, the thing that he had in his hand, holding it up to us, and he was reading from it. A Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay? And you, if you wanted to send out material to Seventh-day Adventist church administrators, they would have them all listed there. General conference administrators, division administrators, union administrators, local conference, they're all there, names and addresses. If you wanted to send out material to Seventh-day Adventists who had three children but not four, they had that too listed. You, you know, or if you, they wanted to send out material to Seventh-day Adventists who are not married yet, they had those listed separately. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists who um, earn between $40,000 and $80,000 a year, they're all listed together, see? And those who earn more than that, they're listed together. The poorer ones listed together. And do you know what they also had listed there? on that uh, document as he shared it with us. Seventh-day Adventists who are considered to be conservatives and another listing, Seventh-day Adventists who are considered to be liberals. They've got it all. They know all about the Seventh-day Adventists. And these people, these companies that gather together lists of names and addresses, they leave no stone unturned to find all the information about you. It's all on computer. And uh, the structure, the structure's there, uh, ready for uh, the application of some of these prophecies and the fulfillment of them in the last days. Now, one of the significant developments um, in, uh, in the uh, religio-political arena is, uh, is the significant or the unfolding drama is the escalation of natural disasters. Now you say, what's that got to do with political things and religious things? The, un the, the escalation of natural disasters. In fact, friends, it's got a lot to do with them. I have here a whole lot of information on that, and I'm just going to have to summarize some of it because we've got to get through before 12. But uh, do you know that um, in one, uh, one four-year period, one three-year period, there were four major disasters in the United States which were record uh, of record magnitude. Um, one of them was Hurricane Andrew. That took place about the time we arrived in the United States. It was the most destructive storm that ever um, came over the United States. Hurricane Andrew, when it had passed over Florida and Louisiana, left hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed, 64 people dead, and $22 billion worth of uh, United States dollars worth of damage. $22 billion. 
Then, shortly after that, they had the worst snowstorm in the eastern United States history, and I was there. It was, it was a, a winter that we went through, and I tell you, it was quite a cold one. 270 people died in their cars, trapped out in the snow and other places, and it left $1 billion worth of damage. Then, the, that year was also the worst year for tornadoes. You know, when I lived in Hamilton as a boy here in New North New Zealand, I remember a tornado coming through and wiping out the township of Frankton, the suburb of Frankton. Some of you might remember that if you lived there. It was like a, a, a terrible roar. It was only about half a mile from our house where we lived. And uh, I remember it picked up a, a plow with about 12 discs on it and threw it about 20 or 30 feet. It was a tremendous tornado that went through Frankton when I was a child. I had not seen much of tornadoes until I went to the United States, and they get a lot of them. Do you know that in that one year, they had 1,381 tornadoes touched down and damaged properties in the United States in one year? The record year for tornadoes. Um, it was followed shortly thereafter by the Mid-America floods, the worst in history when the Mississippi River rose its level 49 feet above where it normally flows and uh, swept out over 30,000 square miles of country, and 46 people died, and $10 billion worth of damage was done. That was followed a few months later by the San Francisco earthquake that left 20,000 people homeless, killed 57 people, and left $20 billion worth of damage. And there was more. Cyclones Marilyn, Cyclone Opal, Cyclone Roxanne, Hurricanes Gordon, Hugo, and George, you know, the combined cost of these uh, disasters I've just mentioned to you comes somewhere near 100 billion United States dollars. Had to be found from somewhere. And, of course, it, it just keeps coming. Fires and floods in 1999, 76 tornadoes came in the United States in 24 hours. One of those tornadoes was a mile wide and stayed on the ground for four hours. Huge damage is done by these natural disasters. And, of course, to top it all off, you have the disaster of September 11, as you know about that. We were in Washington at the time. A Newsweek article asks the question, was Hurricane Andrew a freak or a preview of things to come? Now, that's an interesting question. It might well be a preview. It was a Force 5 hurricane. Now, Force 5 hurricanes are called the 100-year hurricanes because... They have, in the past, only had one Force 5 hurricane every 100 years. Hurricane Andrew was the third Force 5 hurricane in four years. And I read an article in Newsweek about this and points out that the ever-expanding deserts of North Africa are the, the spawning ground for these hurricanes. You know, the, the, the deserts in North Africa are expanding all the time? Productive land is giving way to sand as, as the desert is encroaching further and further south. And, of course, over those deserts you have a lot of heat, the hot burning sun, and the air rises. And as the air rises above those deserts, it gets up there and it begins to stir and it moves out across the Atlantic toward the United States and, and uh, develops into, into cyclones and hurricanes. That's where they're coming from. And as long as those deserts are expanding and growing in size, there are going to be more and greater hurricanes and cyclones in the United States. And that's what the article was saying. Do you know the national debt of the United States? Well, I was going to say, first of all, why am I mentioning these disasters? Well, I'm mentioning them, friends, because the United States will not be able to suffer the financial loss of these natural disasters if they continue to come in increasing intensity and ferocity. They won't be able to bear it. You see, the national debt of the United States, last time I checked on it, was about $6.9 billion, increasing by $1 billion every day. Every day. If they tried to pay off that, um, did I say billion? $6.9 trillion, I'm sorry, $6.9 trillion, increasing by $1 billion per day. 
if they tried to, re to pay that debt off, they, if they'd started back at the birth of Christ and paid a million dollars every day, it would be the year 2,700 before they pay off that debt without paying off any of the interest that's accruing to it. Economists are predicting that by the year 2000, that's back some time back now, all the revenue generated by the tax system in the United States would be needed to pay the interest on the national debt. You know that they have not paid any of the interest on their national debt yet at all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the other way around. They have not paid any of the capital. They're only paying off interest. And, uh, and of course, you wonder how that affects the, the tax system and the social security system of the United States. I was reading some time back how that, um, by law, the United States has to uh, uh, invest the social security money, which is paid by all employees. The social security money must be invested in special issue government bonds. That's by law. Now that has been done. The money's been invested into uh, US government bonds. But what most Americans don't know is that the government has then sold those bonds to pay the interest on the national debt. And so the retirees today who are to be paid from the social security funds are being paid from the money that is being paid into the Social Security Fund by the present employees, you see. So as I pay my Social Security, that money goes to pay some retiree somewhere. It goes straight through, see. And so there are enough employees to pay the retirees. But wait until the, uh, the baby boomers begin to retire, and they tell us that by the year 2010, there will be half as many employees and twice as many retirees. So that compounds the problem by, by the, the, the number four, doesn't it? And uh, one wonders where the money will come from in those days to pay the retirees. Uh, I see on the horizon of the United States uh, large financial problems. And uh, these national, natural disasters are uh, uh, compounding those uh, financial problems for the United States. And... Uh, and that's one of the concerns that these people in the Christian coalition have. They are uh, they're talking about this and they're wondering just how they're going to handle the situation as it gets worse and worse. I, I read you the statement where Pat Robertson said, the recent major natural disasters are evidence that God is displeased with this godless nation. We can expect these disasters to increase until we get our nation back to God. And that reminds me of what Ellen White said in Great Controversy. She said, These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. Now that's an interesting twist, isn't it? Ellen White says that they will then begin to look for the cause. And they will say, Hey, these, these people... See, these people who serve God in the way that we do are causing these evils. Uh, it will be declared, she says, that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance has been strictly enforced, and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. You see, the members of the Christian Coalition are already looking to, to find what is the cause of all these troubles that are coming upon our nation, the United States. What's the cause of it? Uh, we must get our nation back to God, and then perhaps he will, he will bless us and, and lift off these these tragedies and disasters that are coming. But you know what's going to happen, don't you? I mean, they, uh, they're they involved in the middle of, of what they consider as a great religious revival. Uh, I think of, of what um, uh, Peter Marshall had to say. You know, Peter Mar and, and I'm sorry, not Peter Marshall. This time it's James Kennedy. James Kennedy said at one of these conferences, I hope you realize that we are involved in the greatest spiritual awakening in the world. 
And the Christian Coalition, of course, are determined to get into Parliament their candidates each time into government. They missed out on Clinton. He was the wrong, uh, the wrong candidate. They didn't want him there. They did want Dole. Remember Dole was trying for the American presidency? But do you know why he didn't win? I mean, he was a Republican, but he didn't win the presidential election. Do you know why he didn't win? It's because the Christian coalition withdrew their support for Dole before the election took place. And the reason they withdrew their support was because Dole capitulated on the question of abortion. And he no longer stood with the Christian coalition on the subject of abortion. And because he capitulated on that issue, they withdrew their support. And, uh, and their people, their supporters throughout the United States did not vote for Dole. Instead, they voted for uh, Clinton. Now, of course, they have Bush in, in there, and Bush is a Republican. And uh, Bush, Bush's father was a regular attender at the, the uh, Christian Coalition Path to Victory conferences. Uh, he was a regular attender there. I don't think the present Bush, uh, I'm not aware that he was present at any of them, but he certainly holds uh, many of the same views as the people of the Christian Coalition. So here, Ellen White tells us that they would determine, you see, it would be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That's why God's displeased with this godless nation. Here are a people who are violating the Sunday Sabbath. That's the attitude they're going to take. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth from Great Controversy by Ellen White. She had a clear picture of these things. And uh, you see, the motivation for Sunday laws is a desire for divine favor and temporal prosperity. And you say, but how could this possibly happen? I mean, uh, I, I, I want to tell you, first of all, that this, this is the way that uh, Revelation 13 is going to be fulfilled, I believe. It's my opinion. And you can think about that because there will be religious intolerance, religious persecution, Sunday laws, boycott, death decree. And then, of course, final deliverance of God's people. That's the glorious thing at the end. But you see the, the sequence of events there. See, Sunday laws to enforce their, their dogma, boycotts on those who don't go along with it, finally death decree, and, uh, and that's the direction in which it's going to go, we believe. Um, you wonder how they could, how, how would this ever happen? I mean, I've got fine neighbors and I've got lovely friends who are not Adventists and people out there who, who are not Christians at all. And, and you people employ some of these and some of you are employed by them and you have a banker who's kind and, and friendly and helpful to you and, and your dentist and your chemist and, you know... How could it possibly come about? Have you ever thought about that? How could it ever come about where good, fine, uh, law-abiding citizens would ever get to the place where they could um, carry out these things that are referred to in, in Revelation chapter 13? Well, uh, we've just had a, a, a series of Sabbath school lessons on the book of Job. Uh, I'm sorry, the book of uh, Jonah, haven't we? And do you remember what happened when there was a storm and, and the lives of all those people were in danger? You touch the pocketbook. You touch the financial security of people, the money that they've put aside for the education of their children and their children's children, the, the money they've put aside for their retirement or whatever, you touch the financial security of people and they'll be ready to listen to any man who promises a way out, who, get, who convinces them that this is because God is displeased with this godless nation, who convinces them that there is a body of people here who are bringing the curse of God down upon the nation because they will not go along with our religious dogmas. And what will they do? They'll do the same as the boatmen in Jonah's day. They'll hold a prayer meeting and then throw you overboard. That's the way it works. Think about that. 
and just how it can happen. It's hard to imagine religious bigotry of that kind, but the prophecies are there and God never fails in the messages he, he gives to us. I want you to, uh, to notice what Ralph Reed had to say at that uh, Catholic Alliance meeting, the inaugural meeting of the Catholic Alliance, and we're coming near to the end of this. This is what Ralph Reed had to say further to what I read you before. He said, America's 58 million Roman Catholics are the swing vote in American politics. And whoever wins their vote will govern this country into the next century. I believe that this emerging coalition of the roughly 23 to 33 million evangelical Protestants voters, who were already one of the most important voting constituencies, and who are one of the most effective political forces in the electorate today, uniting with their Catholic brothers and sisters on the issues that bring us together, if these two pro-family constituencies come together, there isn't a single bill. You know what he means by the word bill? Something brought into Parliament for voting? Into law? There isn't a single bill that we cannot pass in any legislature in America. And there isn't a single pro-family candidate in any state or any county or any city anywhere in America who cannot win on election day. That is the reality of the emerging coalition. Now those are bold words, aren't they? But what he's saying is we can get anything we want passed through as law because there are 58 million Roman Catholics and there are 30 million evangelical Protestants and when we all put our vote together, we can force the issue. You see, so they're already talking about how they're going to do it. A few years ago, nobody dreamt about this sort of thing. But today, emerging coalition, this is the reality, he says, of that emerging coalition. And I want to tell you that these things could happen very quickly. You know, Ellen White says, great changes are soon to take place in our world. The final movements will be rapid ones. Then you read back two or three sentences before that, and she says, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. That sounds like coalition to me. See, combining their forces and, co and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. No wonder Jesus called on his, uh, his followers to, be, to awake, to be awake and, and, uh, and uh, aware of what's going on in the world. In great controversy, she says, it will be urged that the few who stand in opposition, uh, opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for the whole nation to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. Well, that's going to bring about a shaking time. Did you know that? You hear about the shaking time in the church? That'll bring about a shaking time. That'll test the mettle of the people who claim to be God's church. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken as our allegiance to God and his truth is tested in the last days. In Prophets and Kings, I read this statement, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. You know, friends, I can't overemphasize the importance of the study of God's word. It's only as you are ignorant of these last day events that, that you will miss what's happening. What is, is developing the, the, the preparation that's being made in the world around us for the last final events of Earth's history. Uh, Ellen White says uh, in another place, only those who have fortified their minds with the precious truths of the word of God will stand through the last great crisis. Now, let me say this right at this end. I don't know whether the Christian coalition will bring in the final events of Earth's history or not. But I tell you, it sure looks like they've laid the foundation for it. And we should be glad that the journey is almost over. When my children were little, um, 
And they would ask me over and over again as we traveled in the car, Daddy, what did they ask me? Are we nearly there? <laughs> You've heard the same thing, haven't you? Are we nearly there? And on night journeys, I would show them the glow of the city reflected on the clouds way up front somewhere, and I'd say, yes, we're nearly there. And I want to tell you this morning, friends, to all of you who long for the end of the journey, let me say, lift your eyes and see the glow of the city of God. And that which the apostles and prophets have foretold is soon to come to pass. May God bless you. Shall we pray? Now, loving Father, we are grateful that we have the prophecies that help us to see what's happening, to understand these things. We can see them, but Lord, without the predictions of your word and the spirit of prophecy, we would not understand the significance of what's happening in the world around us today. But we are enlightened by it, and we thank you for that, and pray that you'll keep us ever alert that we may be found ready at last when Jesus comes faithful and true, not shaken out, but standing on the platform of truth right through to the end. We might see Jesus face to face and rejoice in his presence. Bless us, please, to this end, we ask in Jesus' name.